Okay, so um, hi everybody. This is Alexandre Michi. I'm a cardiologist in Montluçon, France. Thank you for joining us, joining us uh, to this beautiful webinar. And I hope you don't fall asleep during the webinar because the subject is sleep management and cardiovascular disease. So we have uh, we have um, uh, uh, very important speakers today, um, uh, and I want to thank uh, thank them for their time um, and thank them for being here. Uh, we also have a special, very special moderators. And I would like to present the first of all um, the uh, my, my two uh, co-moderators, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Beth Freitz, uh, which is assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, and lifestyle medicine specialist, um, health and wellness coach, um, and uh, Dr. Mihai Trofenchuk, uh, which is a cardiologist and the ESCACBD Young National Representative. Uh, hi, uh, Beth. Hi, uh, Mihai. Um, I uh, will leave uh, Beth uh, present um, our first distinguished speaker. So, hi, everybody. Terrific. This is going to be a treat. We have Professor Dieter Riemann, Supervisor of Psychotherapy in Freiburg, Germany, joining. Uh, and I will turn the floor to him. Well, thanks very much, Beth. Thanks to Alex Michi uh, for, for, for inviting me uh, for this event. It's a pleasure to be part of this. And I'm uh, actually an insomnia specialist, and I'm going to talk about chronic insomnia and especially associations with cardiovascular diseases, but also mental disorders and insomnia treatment. I don't have any conflict of interest, and there are two learning objectives I have. The first one is, uh, you should understand after my talk why insomnia is important for somatic and mental health. And you should understand why insomnia treatment could be a preventive strategy for both somatic and mental illness. And I'm a specialist in insomnia and you hear later on about sleep apnea by the second speaker who's a specialist for that. I say a few words. This is my agenda I have for the next 10, 12 minutes. I talk a little bit about the definition of insomnia. You hear something about insomnia epidemiology and its consequences for somatic and mental health. I will say a few words about diagnostic procedures we have for insomnia. I talk about etiology, pathophysiology, and last but not least, about uh, now, we have had a, a real uh, um, massive change in how we perceived insomnia with DSM-5 from the American Psychiatric Association, which was introduced in 2013. And actually the old distinction in primary and secondary insomnia was given up. We now we have just one category, which is insomnia disorder. And as you will expect, uh, we have uh, a sleep problem here problems to fall asleep, maintaining sleep, early morning awakening, and we have a daytime consequence, at least one, in order to diagnose insomnia as, as a disorder. So sleep is disturbed during the night, and we have daytime consequences like fatigue, problems, attention, uh, concentration, mood uh, disturbances. This has to occur at least three nights per week and for three months in order to diagnose it. And we find the DSM-5 criteria also in the ICSD in the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. And it's highly likely that also ICD-11 will take up this new conception of insomnia disorder. Uh, actually, I just show you here some data, some, some films from the sleep lab, not eight hours, but uh, everything compressed down to 30 seconds. And we have a good sleeper and we have a patient with insomnia. And I think you'll see the difference quite easily. And I don't have to tell you who's who. Uh, I think that's quite obvious. And that's, I think, what, what, what English or American people call tossing and turning. Uh, and I think you see it if, if, if you compress it from eight hours down uh, to 30 seconds. There is much more motor activity. So also good sleepers uh, uh, turn in their sleep. That's normal. Yeah. Okay. What about the insomnia ep epidemiology and its consequences for somatic and mental health? Here we have, this is from the European Insomnia Guideline, and here we have summarized data using criteria which are like the insomnia disorder. And you see some figures for Germany, almost 6% 
chronic insomnia. This is chronic insomnia. We're not talking symptoms. Everybody has insomnia symptoms. Once a year, we're talking chronic insomnia. We see England with 5.8, but this is uh, pre-Brexit, I think. Uh, it might look different now. And we see France, quite high figures uh, for insomnia. So on average, and there are some meta-analysis, we would guess that approximately 10% of the adult population in industrialized countries do suffer from chronic insomnia. Um, there has been a very nice meta-analysis published by Sophie in 2012, and these authors looked longitudinal studies at whether insomnia has uh, uh, some predictive value for cardiovascular disease. So at the first measurement point, uh, there was just insomnia, and then they followed these studies, followed up with quite huge studies, altogether over 100,000 subjects. And they come up and they have cardiovascular disease defined as high blood pressure, heart attack and everything. So it's a bit of a mixture here, but actually they come up that there's a significant finding here that if you have insomnia at a given point in time, you have a 1.5 increased risk to develop cardiovascular disease in, well, let's say around the next six to 10 years. And that was a bit surprising at the time because insomnia is always thought to be, you know, it's a psychological thing and it, it's not, such a risk factor for, for somatic disease. Interestingly, the situation is quite clear if we look at insomnia as a predictor of other, just insomnia alone without psychopathology. This is analysis we published in uh, 2019. We looked at uh, the predictive value of insomnia for depression. And we have here like a 2.8 risk and for anxiety disorders. And here we have like 3.2 risk. So it's quite clear that insomnia is to some extent a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but um, the relationship to mental disorders is much stronger than it is to somatic disorders. And there is one very interesting published uh, paper Nature Genetics in 2019. And this was a, a genetic analysis of, I think, over 10,000 subjects. They used a special analysis. They call this Mendelian analysis. I don't know what it is exactly. It's a very sophisticated statistical technique. And they uh, um, uh, conclude from their data that evidence, evidence is found for a possible causal link between insomnia symptoms, coronary artery heart disease, depressive symptoms, and subjective well-being. This underlines that not only we have these epidemiological associations, but we also have associations on the level of genes here, which I think is a very important kind of proof of concept. Now, and the question is then, I think that's the important question, could the treatment of insomnia, uh, either as a, a professional treatment or as a like a lifestyle uh, counseling, could this be a preventive strategy for somatic and mental disorders? This still needs to be proven. We are, uh, it's early days yet in that field, but there is one I think promising study coming from Australia, and they uh, investigated 1,200 subjects, and this was an internet-based therapy study, and 600 subjects, they had insomnia and subclinical depression, received cognitive behavioral treatment, 600 patients did receive a CAM treatment, and there's a clear-cut impact, significant sustainable impact, insomnia treatment on depressive symptomatology. We don't have such data yet for cardiovascular disease, but I think this is really a challenge. And we should look at this, whether a proper insomnia treatment, uh, re-establishing normal sleep, understood sleep, would also be uh, uh, positively uh, predict uh, less cardiovascular disease. Let me say a few words about diagnostic procedures, uh, what, what we can do here. And it's, it's, I think it's really very important that we have anamnesis here. Insomnia is not, I know many, many GPs think insomnia is a psychological thing and okay, it's stress and something. So they don't do proper uh, medical uh, investigation, but I think this is really very important not to overlook something. We need to have a look at substances. What substances do people use? 
especially alcohol plays a very negative role here uh, because alcohol is used so frequently in the Western population. So very important. And we should also should do lab test, uh, lab testing, like uh, should have a look at the thyroid function and so on as uh, if, if it's suspected. We should have a look at the psychiatric psychological side. We should have a very good look at the sleep side. So uh, take a sleep history, use sleep diaries. These are very easy to use. These come cheap. Uh, you just need a, a one sh a sheet of paper. Patients need to fill it out. And we can use, if, if it comes to more expensive investigations, we could use actigraphy, which is most of the modern uh, um, um, fitness trackers have it. You know, and uh, in some cases of insomnia, we would also do polysomnography if they're suspected uh, sleep apnea. And sleep apnea and insomnia, they are not uh, uh, exclusive, but uh, we, we now know that uh, in a, within our insomniac patients, we have at least 10% also having sleep apnea, and also quite a few in, uh, apnea patients having uh, insomnia. So it's not exclusive. So be careful, check it out. Uh, this is what a sleep pattern of an insomnia patient. We have a good sleeper, we have non-REM sleep, deep sleep, we have REM sleep, the red bars, and here we have an insomnia patient. And you see, there's this, this is not a, a disturbance of the macrostructure. Many insomnia patients claim, I didn't sleep at all, I just had three or four hours. Actually, if we look at the polysomnogram, we, we usually we find something like six hours of sleep. It's less than normal, but it's not as drastic as the subjective experience of the patient tells us. And what we think is important is the microstructure. So we have many, many brief wake periods. We have lots of micro arousals. And here on the right side, we have a frequency analysis. And what we find here with the insomnia is that there's an increased frequency or increased amount of fast frequencies, even during slow wave sleep. So that could be the case that uh, the loss of consciousness that we usually experience with sleep as good sleepers is not as complete in insomniac patients because they have so many signs of arousal the whole night. A few words about the etiology, pathophysiology. Uh, this is a psychological model put forward by Art Spielman in the, actually comes from, from the eighties. And he says, there must be some pre-morbid factors because everybody has insomnia once in a year, but maybe 10% of the population have chronic insomnia. And you speculated about genetics, and there is clear cut genes play a role. We think 30 to 40% of the variance at least is explained by genetic factors in chronic insomnia. He talks about precipitating factors, and that's we all know that there are stressors, triggers for insomnia, and he talks about perpetuating factors. And what, what really the important thing with this theory is uh, uh, Spielman discovered that many insomniacs spend too much time in bed. So he coined the term sleep restriction therapy for a very successful behavioral therapy, meaning if you have insomnia, intuitively you would try to catch up, you go to bed early, but that in itself can become a perpetuating factor. So he suggested that with chronic insomnia, initially, shorten your time in bed because it strengthens your sleep drive. There are other models, uh, Charles Morin from, from Quebec, uh, he stresses the arousal, which the patients experience, which they tell you the dysfunctional cognitions uh, in chronic insomnia, the worry over the sleep loss, the ruminations of the consequences, unrealistic experiences in some elderly who, if you're over 80 and, and you expect nine or 10 hours, you, you're lost. You know, you may get seven hours, and then you have three hours in bed, not sleeping, and you define yourself as insomniac. But that really is something which should be uh, corrected by by counseling. We have the maladaptive sleep habits, prolonged bed, irregular sleep schedules, daytime napping, sleep incompatible. Alcohol use is still a frequent strategy. How people and in the long run, it has um, really negative effects on sleep. Yeah, sleep doesn't improve. Really, your sleep maintenance problems increase. And we have the consequences, the mood swings, fatigue, and so on. And we think that 
insomnia, chronic insomnia should be conceptualized as a kind of psychophysiological arousals. We see it on the CNS level with the fast, the increases in arousals. We have uh, increased heart rate, um, at not on a level a cardiologist would, would get patients, but um, it's increased if we analyze it. During the night, we have altered heart rate variabilities, and we also have increased cortisol output here in these uh, patients, uh, which shows that these patients are in a kind of permanent stress situation. Where are we now with treatments? What can we help our patients? There have been, interestingly, at least four new guidelines out in the last four years. The first one came from the American College of Physicians, published in 2016. The American Academy for Sleep Medicine published there's a German guideline and there's a European guideline where I was involved with. And actually all these guidelines come to the conclusion that at present, not drugs or hypnotics, but actually treatment is a good way to go. And I'm saying a few words about this is here, what all of these guidelines say. So there's really a homogeneous opinion about that. And what, what is this cognitive behavior treatment? It's um, based on relaxation techniques, also mindfulness. It's based on cognitive techniques, imagery, fantasy, the voyage. It's based on sleep hygiene, absolutely no alcohol. This would be, don't watch the clock during the night because that puts you under stress. And specific techniques like stimulus control and sleep restriction. And actually these techniques aim at shortening the time in bed with the idea that if you stay awake longer with insomnia, which sounds paradoxical at a first glance, but uh, if you stay awake longer, it increases your sleep drive. So actually you won't sleep more if you reduce your bedtime down to six hours, but you will sleep. Your sleep onset latency will be shortened and your sleep will be deepened by this technique. And we have cognitive techniques where we look at the worrying, the ruminations, and we, we teach patients how to deal with this. And the major problem at present is that CBTI, the data, the evidence is very good, but the question is how can we put this into healthcare? And not many patients up to now have access to it because it's, you know, it's specialized academic centers use it, sleep centers, but not every GP knows about that. And so there is a lot of um, uh, uh, activity going on um, devising internet-based therapies. There's an, a British program called Sleepio in the, in the US, there's Shatai. So you can, I think for maybe two thirds of patients, internet-based approaches can really play a role in helping them. And maybe, and this is already my last slide about the pharmacological interventions. I don't want to talk too long about it. Pharmacologic interventions can be offered if CBTI is not sufficiently effective or not available. And what is the drugs who have an indication, which have an indication for insomnia treatment are the benzodiazepines, the benzodiazepines receptor uh, uh, agonists, and some other side. This should be used for people, for patients having uh, a severe mental disorder. So concluding, I'd say insomnia is a free, chronic insomnia is a frequent problem. It has repercussions for mental health, quite strong. It has repercussions for somatic health. We also know that if you have, for example, a cancer diagnosis and insomnia, it's more difficult to treat than having cancer alone. And if you treat the insomnia properly, you'll help the patients, they will have a better course of the disease and that also applies naturally to cardiovascular disease. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, conclude and finish my talk. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Riemann, for this uh, extraordinary lecture on uh, sleep and uh, insomnia. I would like uh, to mention that uh, you are also the author of a, a clinical practice guideline for diagnostic testing uh, for uh, adult obstructive uh, sleep uh, apnea. Uh, uh, professor Kapoor, sorry. Uh, you, Professor Riemann, are uh, the, the main author for European guideline for the diagnosis and treatment of insomnia. Yes, correctly? Sure. 
Yeah. So, uh, sorry, uh, one of the questions that uh, I would like you to um, to think uh, about it, it's uh, which are the difference between uh, the, the two guidelines? And uh, talking about the American Academy of Sleep and Medicine Clinical Practice Guideline, I would like to introduce Professor Kapoor. Uh, he is also an expert in sleep medicine and uh, pulmonary disease. Professor? Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I'm honored uh, to speak about the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. Let me get my uh, slides up for you folks. So I'm going to be talking about the diagnosis of sleep apnea from the perspective of a cardiologist, um, mostly focusing on the uh, evaluation and testing for sleep apnea, but I'll also give you a few slides about the relevance of sleep apnea for the cardiologist. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, to provide a little bit of background on sleep apnea, there are actually uh, two different uh, disorders under the rubric of sleep apnea. Uh, on the left hand side of the slide, you can see a conceptualization of central sleep apnea. So apnea obviously means the absence of breathing for a period of time. And in the case of central sleep apnea, the cause of the, ap of the absence of breathing is a lack of respiratory drive during that period of time. And that's what's reflected in the uh, row dealing with diaphragmatic excursions. On the other hand, what we're mostly talking about today is a more common form of sleep apnea, which is obstructive sleep apnea, where the underlying issue is in a uh, closure or partial closure of the upper airway. So it's not that respiratory effort is being made, uh, actually respiratory effort is greater uh, during the apnea episodes, it's just that there is greater resistance to the upper airway. And both of these types of breathing events can cause transient oxygen desaturation, which appears to be a very important stimulus in terms of the negative consequences of, of sleep apnea. So uh, why, why is uh, obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea relevant to the cardiologist? So with regards to obstructive sleep apnea, it is very highly prevalent in the general population. So when we look at adults, the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is over 15%. And then when we start to look at specific groups of people, so especially those with obesity, we get to about a quarter of the population. And then for cardiologists, the disorders you're dealing with have prevalence of sleep apnea of greater than 30%. Um, and some notable uh, high points in terms of prevalence are its prevalence in heart failure where the prevalence is over 50% and the pre prevalence in individuals with resistant hypertension, which it's up to 80%. So many of your patients have obstructive sleep apnea. And the result of those partial and complete breathing pauses that are occurring is intermittent hypoxia, fragmentation of sleep, as well as large swings in intrathoracic pressure. So if the airway is partially closed, it takes a lot more suction to bring air into the airway. Those result in other consequences downstream. For example, the increased intrathoracic pressure can cause changes in preload and afterload on the heart. That leads to subclinical consequences and then potentially to disease endpoints such as hypertension and other uh, cardiovascular and metabolic disorders. The one I want to highlight here is hypertension, where the uh, causality between obstructive sleep apnea and hypertension is very well developed. So we know having more sleep apnea leads to the development of new hypertension. And we've also demonstrated that if you randomize folks with obstructive sleep apnea to CPAP for a month, for example, blood pressure will decrease. So the causal link there is very well established. For some of these other outcomes, certainly there's prospective data that shows an association so uh, an individual with more sleep apnea is more likely to have a stroke down the load. What hasn't been shown is in randomized controlled trials that you can prevent uh, these disorders. 
partly because of the logistics of doing these types of studies, which take many years to do, and the numbers of patients involved, and the challenges in getting folks adherent to therapy. What is very compelling is the evidence from observational studies that show that if you're seen in a sleep clinic and you have severe sleep apnea and you go on and use therapy, your risk of these outcomes is much lower than some this kind of equivalent person who doesn't uh, go on to therapy. So hopefully I've uh, given you an idea of why it's important to be aware of obstructive sleep apnea and identify it in your patients. And now I wanna move on to talk about how to identify it in your patients. Um, so the previous slide and this slide are from a recent uh, review in Journal of American Medical Association by Dan Gottlieb uh, and Naresh Punjabi. It's uh, an excellent review and I recommend it if you wanna learn more about this area. So this is a table from that uh, article that talks about the risk factors and clinical features of obstructive sleep apnea. And in terms of risk factors, we're talking about weight, sex, age, and postmenopausal status. I think what I wanna highlight in this is the importance of obesity. So a four to 10 times risk with obesity. And for women, I wanna highlight the fact that the risk really increases significantly in the postmenopausal state. So three to four times risk. At the bottom of, of this slide, we see the clinical signs and symptoms. So things like excessive sleepiness, snoring, witnessed apneas, and nocturia. I wanna highlight a few issues on these different symptoms. So it is possible to have obstructive sleep apnea without excessive sleepiness. So we do see patients with very severe obstructive sleep apnea who have no subjective complaints. In fact, obstructive sleep apnea can present in three different phenotypes. It can present with the classic phenotype, which is the individual with excessive sleepiness, which is a phenotype that has a highest risk of cardiovascular issues. It can present with folks who present predominantly with insomnia, and then it can also present with minimal symptoms. Snoring is a very important uh, uh, symptom because it's a relatively sensitive indicator of obstructive sleep apnea whose specificity increases as you have louder snoring. So louder snoring is particularly predictive. Witness apneas or the patient reporting choking or gasping is a very specific finding. So if a bed partner is reporting this about a patient or the patient is reporting this, it's very likely they have obstructive sleep apnea, but it's not a history you'll get in everyone. And then another feature I really wanna highlight is this issue of nocturia, uh, which is highly prevalent in folks with more severe sleep apnea. And, and there are uh, physiologic reasons why obstructive sleep apnea results in diuresis during the night. So, uh, People have developed instruments to make this simple for you. Uh, what I'm projecting here is a very popular instrument to identify obstructive sleep apnea called the stop bang instrument. So basically it's asking if your patient snores, is tired, has been seen to have apneic episodes, has blood pressure, that's the stop portion of the questionnaire. And then the bang portion is the BMI, age, next circumference, which is also very co correlated with obstructive sleep apnea and gender. And so basically you assign a point to each of these that has a yes response and getting three or more of these questions uh, indicates a higher risk group for obstructive sleep apnea. The higher the score, the higher the risk. So not very difficult to screen your patients for obstructive sleep apnea. I think the thing to remember here is the patients that you're seeing already have a very high pretest probability of obstructive sleep apnea. And so you should have a very low threshold for considering a, a sleep study in your patients. And let's talk now about the sleep studies that are available. What I'm showing here is the classic gold standard study for obstructive sleep apnea, which is called polysomnography. This is usually performed in a sleep laboratory situation. And you can see that there are multiple sensors that are placed on the patient for the study, including sensors to measure electrical activity of the brain so we can define sleep, as well as parameters that help us define breathing issues, such as an airflow sensor, 
bands around the chest and abdomen and the oximeter. And the result of this is that we get in-depth information about breathing and sleep and are able to uh, not only identify issues such as oxygen desaturation, but also sleep disruption related to obstructive sleep apnea. On the other hand, we have newer tests which are simpler and can be performed in the home. These are called home sleep apnea tests. And here I'm showing the two major types of home sleep apnea tests. On the left-hand side, we have an individual who's wearing essentially the respiratory signals that one would get on a laboratory-based sleep study. What's missing are the EEG parameters. So we can't measure sleep, but we can measure breathing. On the right-hand side is a very novel technique to measure sleep apnea in the home. Um, so this is basically a plethysmogram, which is on one of the fingers, and uh, oximetry, which is on another finger. And the watch itself also has actigraphy. And the principle here is that when someone has an obstructive apneic event, there's a release of adrenergic activity that occurs that causes vasoconstriction in the, in the finger. And so the plethysmogram is measuring a decrease in the amplitude of the pulse. It's also measuring an increase in pulse rate that occurs with that event. And, the, and it's correlating that with the oximetry. So this is also a very well validated device uh, that the recent American Academy of Sleep Medicine guidelines also allows for the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. The results of these different types of tests ultimately is uh, an index called the apnea hypopnea index. Certainly this is not all the information that's obtained from the study. There's information about oxygen saturation and sleep disruption and other things depending on the test that's involved. But this is a metric that seems to be very important and is used to establish the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. What the apnea hypopnea index is basically the number of complete and partial breathing pauses occurring per hour of sleep. And so this AHI um, is used to then to see if the individual has a threshold <clears throat> that's consistent with obstructive sleep apnea and further the higher levels of the apnea hypopnea index correspond with severity. So there is a little bit of complication in here in that there are different definitions of partial breathing pauses and hypopnea. And here I'm presenting the more conservative definition of a hypopnea that requires a 4% oxygen desaturation to mark an event as a hypopnea. So when once, once you, someone uses this particular criteria, the uh, levels I show below apply. So more than five events per hour is considered abnormal. Once you get to events more than 15 per hour, you get into the moderate or severe range. What is the practical consequence of severity for the patient? It turns out that even mild patients can have, even patients with mild obstructive sleep apnea can have very severe symptoms. So in a symptomatic patient, you're going to treat obstructive sleep apnea regardless of uh, the severity. On the other hand, the more severe the sleep apnea, particularly when you get to moderate to severe levels, is where we worry more about the cardiovascular consequences, because these are individuals who are having higher levels of intermittent hypoxemia during the night. Now I want to go through some of the uh, recommendations from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine clinical guideline that I was involved with. So the recommendation of this guideline is that before you do a diagnostic test, you should have a comprehensive sleep evaluation to assess if there are other sleep issues present and to assess whether you're choosing the correct test. The second issue is there's no point in getting a test unless you know how to interpret the test and follow up on the findings. Uh, so I, both these things should be present when you're going on to testing. The uh, change in the clinical guideline from prior guidelines was that now home sleep apnea testing is reasonable for the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea in uncomplicated adult patients with increased risk of moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. The proviso here is that the home sleep apnea test is less sensitive than polysomnography 
So if you have a patient who has a very high risk of obstructive sleep apnea with a negative home sleep apnea test, you should go on to do polysomnography before you exclude the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. So uh, the question may be, what is an uncomplicated patient? Um, and an uncomplicated patient is really a patient who uh, doesn't have risk for other types of breathing disorder besides obstructive sleep apnea. So the other types of breathing disorder we're talking here is central sleep apnea and hypoventilation. And for the cardiologist, what is of concern is central sleep apnea, which is more common in individuals who are male, older, have heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So particularly a patient with very severe heart failure should probably go to polysomnography rather than a home sleep apnea test. The guideline also provides some uh, parameters in which to decide if someone is at increased risk of moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. This is on the basis of the entry criteria for the randomized control studies that found home sleep apnea testing was equivalent to polysomnography in certain patient groups. So where the home sleep apnea test has been well validated is in individuals who have excessive sleepiness and have two of the following criteria. Habitual loud snoring, witnessed apneas or gasping, or hypertension. So fairly simple algorithm to decide if your patient may fit into a more simple testing algorithm. And this is just emphasizing the issue of more complicated patients. So uh, if you're thinking about sleep apnea in your patient with severe heart failure, um, who is at risk of central sleep apnea, the way to go is the gold standard diagnostic study. This is because the home monitors, though they do have some ability to distinguish central sleep apnea from obstructive sleep apnea, are not very well validated for this purpose. To summarize, Sleep apnea is very common in your patients and can contribute to the development and progression of, of cardiovascular disease. The important risk factors include obesity, age, male sex. Habitual snoring is a very sensitive predictor of obstructive sleep apnea, while witnessed apneas and chokings is a very specific predictor. If you're going to do diagnostic testing, it's important to do a thorough sleep history and evaluation prior to the testing and make sure that the patient has adequate follow-up so the results are acted on. We now have means that are less complicated for the diagnosis and those are most appropriately applied in patients at high risk for moderate to severe sleep apnea. And the important issue here is that if you have a negative test in this population, do the gold standard study. And in, our, in the population that you'll be seeing, uh, there often is a higher risk of central sleep apnea. And so uh, 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 some of these patients would be, be better evaluated with the gold standard test. So um, I, uh, that is the end of my presentation. I've mostly focused on diagnosis and evaluation. Um, I certainly have excluded therapy, but I'm happy to answer any questions about that uh, as come up. Thank you so much, Professor Kapoor. That was a wonderful presentation and we'll be taking questions at the end. Next, we have Alexandru Nishi, Head of Interventional Cardiology in the department uh, in Center Hospital, Montlucan, France. And his presentation is How to Sleep Better, All You Need to Know. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, thank you uh, to all the speakers. So uh, even though I'm not an expert uh, in, uh, in sleep medicine, I will just try to, to sum up um, what I have learned until now uh, from my experience. Uh, so um, just maybe a few points regarding sleep apnea from the cardiologist's point of view. Um, both decreased and increased duration of sleep uh, lead to increased cardiovascular mortality and uh, all this has a u-shaped curve the sleep apnea is an independent risk factor for atherosclerosis and, and hypertension and its treatment with uh, cpap results in increased survival 
um, experts estimated that the, the normal duration or the recommended duration uh, of sleep should be between six and eight hours. And uh, this is associated with decreased mortality and major cardiovascular events uh, and should be addressed by clinicians during routine visits. Um, also, screening for sleep apnea should be a priority in patients with hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and refractory heart failure. I will briefly um, mention a few studies uh, regarding uh, sleep uh, and um, heart uh, pathologies. So we have uh, clear evidence that uh, sleep uh, anomalies and uh, uh, sleep apnea uh, leads to hypertension and um, uh, also hypertension leads to uh, alterations in, 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 the, in the sleep. Um, we also have evidence that um, uh, sleep perturbance uh, and sleep anomalies lead to atrial fibrillation. Um, also, um, heart failure. Don't forget to, to look for uh, sleep apnea in patients with ref refractory heart failure uh, or with heart failure uh, without uh, a very clear, um, a very clear um, etiology. And um, the last sleep and coronary heart disease, uh, I would just like to mention this study on 60,000 adults, uh, which concluded that both short uh, sleep duration and poor sleep quality are associated with the risk of coronary heart disease. The association for long sleep duration does not reach statistical significance in this study. So sleep uh, um, touches uh, almost uh, every aspect of uh, heart disease, except maybe the valvular, valvular heart disease. We should uh, be very careful as cardiologists and even as general practitioners um, to how uh, sleep disturbances affect uh, our patient's life. And this is just, these are some lines, lines from my personal experience. So how to get a better sleep? Go to sleep at the same time each night and get up at the same time each morning, even on weekends. Don't take naps uh, after 3 p.m. and don't nap longer than 20 minutes. Get regular exercise, but not within two to three hours uh, of bedtime. Increase bright light exposure during the day and reduce blue light exposure in the evening. Optimize your bedroom uh, environment. Uh, that means to make your bedroom comfortable, dark, quiet, and not too warm or cold. Around 20 degrees seem to be a comfortable temperature for most people, although it depends on your preferences and habits. Also, get a comfortable bed, mattress, and pillow. Don't eat a heavy meal late in the day. Uh, you can eat a light snack before bedtime, but it should be really light. Follow a routine to help you relax before sleep, for example, reading or listening to music, and turn off the TV and other screens um, for at least an hour before bedtime. Relax and clear your mind in the, in the evening, and don't lie in the bed awake. If you can't fall asleep after 20 minutes, just do something that might calm you or that uh, induces uh, sleep, like reading or listening to soft music. And the last two points, take a relaxing bath uh, or shower before sleep and don't drink alcohol. This is a tough thing to do, um, especially in the evenings when, when family, uh, families uh, sit and eat uh, uh, dinner and, and of course they have uh, an occasional um, uh, glass of wine. Uh, don't drink any liquids, liquids before uh, bed and stay away from uh, caffeine uh, late in the day. Also, um, it is, um, um, it, I, I should say that we should uh, avoid the nicotine for those uh, of us who smoke. Uh, these are my considerations, even though uh, it's just a personal point of view. Uh, and uh, I will give the word to uh, Beth. Um, I'm sorry for the noisy environment uh, you might have heard. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you so much for those great tips and tricks that we can all utilize for ourselves and our patients. 
So if you do have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. We have some questions uh, percolating already. So one of those is when we see our patients, we have a short period of time to assess them. What can we do, say, within a minute to, to help identify any sleep disturbances? A lot of people use, how many hours of sleep are you getting? But I believe we need a better question than that. So if you could speak to that, that'd be terrific. Maybe, Maybe. Professor Kapoor or Professor Riemann? Uh, if I can start, Professor Riemann? Um, you yeah, sure. Yeah, I think the big issue here is, is sleep apnea in this population. And I would suggest uh, having a, a simple questionnaire, uh, just even the stop portion of the stop bank questionnaire, snoring, tired, observed apneas, and high blood pressure. Uh, and let, let that uh, help you identify your patients who uh, may need issues and have a very low threshold if uh, two of those questions are, are positive uh, to go on for referral. Terrific. And if they live alone or, or sleep alone, it's going to be hard to know about the snoring. Um, of course, they'll, they'll know if they feel as if they're choking and gasping. Uh, you mentioned the home sleep apnea test with the watch and finger monitor. How would patients get a hold of one of those? So, you know, uh, home sleep apnea tests are not screening tests. They're really diagnostic tests. Mm. So, so that happens after there's a evaluation that says that they're appropriate for it. So it's usually ordered by a sleep specialist. Uh, there may be cardiologists have very close relationship with a sleep center where they can refer in directly and, and get the test and then have the sleep center follow up on the results. Mm -hmm. Terrific, great. And then people often talk about shift work and I'm wondering, uh, Professor Riemann with insomnia, if you know of correlations between shift work and insomnia and how that, how that plays into our, our patients' diagnosis. Yes. It's really very important uh, in, in industrialized countries, at least 10% of the population do night shift work. And it's especially night shift disturbs our circadian rhythms. And it can be strongly involved with, uh, with insomnia because the problem is if you have a weak night shift, you have to sleep during the day and it can be very troublesome to get enough sleep. And so you have to ask for it if you take the anamnesis. And uh, if the insomnia is related to shift work, uh, really the, the therapy also looks different because I mean, the first and easiest step is you ask the patient, can you organize three months without a night shift and then we see what will happen and in many cases um, uh, employers will play along but in other cases employers uh, will not play along and then it's really it's, it's much more difficult than than a, a, an insomnia without shift work to deal with it right okay thank you so much and along those lines a sleep diary we hear of this as clinicians that there are sleep diaries and you can find many available to you. But do you, Professor Riemann, have specific ones that you would recommend for us to utilize with our patients? Yeah, I mean, there is a consensus sleep diary. We use a German version naturally, but at the initial, the original version was published in English. It's published in Sleep and it's Colleen Carney is the first author. And this is the consensus sleep diary. And actually it's useful what we do if patients make an appointment, they get a link from us to a secure web page, and where we have instruments like the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index and other instruments. So you can fill it out online. And then when the patient comes to my office, I can just check it and see uh, not just the raw data, but I can see the scores on, on the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. I can see the screening questions. And that uh, um, really saves a lot of time. Yeah. That, terrific. That is a great resource, and, and thank you so much for sharing. Here's a question that has come up. What is a healthy sleep duration? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, the question is how we measure it, and I'm very critical. There have been thousands of publications in the last 10 years saying there's a U-shaped curve between sleep duration and six to eight hours is the best considering mortality and morbidity. And I would 
uh, agree with that. But we can you can have outliers. It's like it's a it's a, it's a, it's a Gaussian curve. It's the normal distribution. You have short sleepers, people who get along with five hours and they are not at risk, and you have people who, who need nine hours and they are not at risk. But on average, I'd say the six to our eight hour bracket is the most healthiest bracket. But on the other hand, uh, um, and as in a, uh, from a statistical point of view, but on the other hand, uh, um, as I said before, you, you can have outliers on both sides. Yes, right. I have seen that there is a genetic variation where certain members of the population actually can get by with five hours, but it's a very small uh, percentage yes. of the population, right? And during medical school, at least when I was in medical school, I was taught that, oh, you're going to be a doctor, so you only need less than five hours. And we, we persevere. We somehow get through all of this uh, because we are different. Um, I thought I believed that for a little while until I fell asleep at the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Post call, which is you know we didn't talk too much about that today, but driving while drowsy is one of the major uh, yeah, problems. Absolutely. Yeah. I think Chuck Zeisler from Harvard has done a lot of work on this, especially residents, and showing that eighty hours of work is not too healthy for your sleep and very dangerous also for your patients. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, basically for, for us as practitioners, we heard about the tips and tricks from um, um, Alexandru. What, what do you tell uh, patients when they are experiencing um, sleep problems? They're not, say, diagnosed into insomnia, but what's your number one tip or trick uh, for people to get a better night's sleep? We'll ask both you and uh, Professor Kapur this. Oh, Professor, uh, if you want to? Sure. Um, you know, I think a consistency of schedule is very important. Um, you know, we all have a circadian rhythm and, uh, you know, we want to have that consistency of that rhythm and we want to align our sleep with that rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, probably the, the, the second is uh, not, not to spend too much time in bed or not to spend too little time in bed. Um, so if I was to give a very generic recommendation, that would be it. Okay, terrific. And we have several others, uh, obviously, um, uh, that we heard. I just was wondering what your top ones were. Dr. Riemann, do you have top, top recommendations? Uh, I fully agree with my colleague, uh, not too long and not too short time in bed, being regular. And then two very important factors. I'd say if you have a sleep problem, don't drink alcohol. It's not, good for, it's not good for apnea, it's not good for insomnia. And if you have insomnia, don't watch the clock during the night because nope. then it's a kind of self-terrorizing if you watch the clock and count but, the minutes. <laughs> and I think most of us can relate to the caffeine that uh, Alexandra mentioned because actually it was, it was during medical school that I started consuming caffeine, but realizing that caffeine actually binds to the same re receptor as adenosine. And adenosine is one of those signals, right? That, that helps us know yeah. it's time for sleep. It builds up in the brain. And, and just realizing that, which I didn't learn in pharmacology, by the way, in medical school, I learned it later on in lifestyle medicine, but understanding the half-life of caffeine, which I know is, it varies with metabolism, but four to six hours, that's why we recommend in lifestyle medicine not to consume caffeine after 12 uh, at, at any rate. So I, I hear you with the alcohol, and that is a tough one uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the other question I have, and I think Mihai also has a question, but is about um, blue wavelength light. Again, Alexandra mentioned this. Uh, there are blue wavelength light blocking glasses. Do you recommend those? And if so, do you have a specific brand or type uh, that, that you, you would share with us that we can share with our patients and perhaps ourselves if we want to continue working on our computer until late at night? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because it's, it's, it's quite clear that if you have uh, your mobile or your, your laptop, some people have them in bed uh, and you, you, practically you shower yourself in light, which is stimulating all kinds of tricks to circumvent this. Either, I think that the most, most of the mobile phones now have a filter to filter this out. It's important yes. 
I don't have a special brand for that, but I think it's very important. We have uh, really to watch out for um, not to get too much light in the evening hours. Mm -hmm. Terrific, thank you. Did you have something, Mihai? I thought you were... Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to ask uh, which are the differences between the two guidelines, the American guideline and the European one, because uh, I mentioned it uh, earlier. So, so if you're talking about the, the insomnia versus the sleep apnea, it's yes. the, the topic that it's addressing. Um, you know, so the, the guideline I was involved with was uh, the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. And I believe uh, Dr. Riemann's guideline was on uh, insomnia. And certainly there's an overlap between the two topics in that patients with obstructive sleep apnea have insom can have insomnia um, and vice versa. But uh, uh, a, a, a different focus. And uh, Professor uh, Riemann, you mentioned earlier the usage of uh, of mobile phones. Uh, how do you see the influence on uh, of social media into think, insomnia and sleep? I think there is an important influence here, and I think it mostly applies to younger people. I'd say. Let's start from, from 12 to 25. They sleep with their mobiles. We did a study once where we allowed, usually in our sleep lab, we don't allow, uh, the, the mobile has to go into the drawer, but this study, we allowed it. And 90%, and these were just young people, they were practically falling asleep with the mobile in their hand and not switched off, I think. And if, if you hear this bing, bing, bing the whole night, I think it puts you in a terrific alarm situation. So I would really recommend to ban the mobile or other devices from your sleeping environment. But right. I really, yeah. the target population is, is people up to 30. Yes, but sometimes as doctors, we need to have it on 24 hours a day. Yeah, but that's not new. That has, I mean, that also worked with the landline you used to have in, in, in the hospital, when you slept in hospital during, when you're on duty. And it's well known a doc, that doctors on duty sleep differently. You don't reach the very deep sleep phases because actually either, or maybe if you're like an elephant and you take it, but otherwise uh, everybody, you, you are in an alarm situation. You know the clock, the, uh, the phone could ring any situation. So your brain goes to bed and says, no, we don't go too deep down into sleep because we could be awakened any second. Mm. So would you recommend uh, us uh, to ask each of our patients, how did you sleep last night? And this question is uh, for Professor uh, Kapoor as well. Uh, I think uh, more generically, you know, are you satisfied with your sleep quality? Satisfied, yes. And, and yeah. um, you know, do you feel, wake up refreshed? Um, do you have repeated awakenings during the night? Those are important questions. Um, but probably in, in, for the cardiologist, the most important question is, uh, you know, do you snore uh, because of that prevalent, high prevalence of sleep apnea and, and the intervention being directly related to outcomes in your patients? And with that, uh, Professor Kapoor, in terms of snoring, I noted a number of times it was loud snoring uh, noted. So perhaps you can just speak to that. Yes, yeah, so it, it seems like uh, both habitual snoring, so snoring happening more than three or four times a night um, is predictive, but also the loudness of the snoring. You know, as we know, there are many people who snore who don't have sleep apnea, but it seems like when it, the snoring is described as earth shattering, then the specificity of that snoring as an indicator of sleep apnea is markedly increased. Yep. So I would have a question for Professor Riemann. Professor Riemann, would you say that it's better to drink a glass of wine in the morning? No. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Uh, I think I think uh, we 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 uh, 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 the best thing would be to abstain from uh, if you have a sleep problem abstain from alcohol. This applies to sleep apnea because the alcohol will really uh, 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 um, have a very negative impact on your breathing. And uh, uh, same for uh, insomnia. And the thing is, I, I discuss this on an individual uh, basis with patients. I say, okay, let's make a test. To the next two weeks, you refrain from alcohol. 
and then you see what happens. And then there are patients coming back and they saying, I slept much better, but I miss the alcohol. So I say, okay, it's up to you. I'm not here to, you know, I'm not your personal dictator and prohibiting alcohol, but alcohol has a negative consequence on your sleep. That's how it is. And that's the scientific evidence. And having the glass in the morning, that's a nice, <laughs> nice alternative. <laughs> It, but I don't know whether our employers would like that. <laughs> no, for sure. But maybe in the weekends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would have maybe one last question if my, my uh, co-moderators uh, don't have any more questions for Professor Kapoor. So I, I know that uh, our dear colleague Beth is a, is a huge fan of yoga. Professor Kapoor, what would you say uh, would be the influence of yoga on, on sleep in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I want to broaden that to uh, yoga and uh, exercise. So, you know, I think uh, the U.S. Preventive Health Task Force recommendations are 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. And in their statement, they also talk about the substantial benefits in terms of sleep with that recommendation. Um, I think for yoga, the issue is uh, relaxation, mindfulness, um, with, and you know those sorts of practices are, are, are very helpful in terms of uh, turning off the mind and, and uh, facilitating sleep. Thank you so much. So uh, I'd like to give the word uh, to, to Beth and then to Mihai. Maybe they have uh, um, other questions before we uh, will conclude in about one or two minutes. Beth? Terrific, thank you. This has been tremendous, uh, very useful, helpful to see the research and then to also get practical tips and advice. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, as same uh, as Beth uh, said, especially for the pra practical tips that I will start using tomorrow morning. I will start asking my patients. Thank you, guys. So um, uh, even though Professor Riemann uh, advised us not to, to, to uh, look at the watch, uh, Unfortunately, the, the, the clock is ticking. So no I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to, to, to thank once again to Professor uh, Visnes Kapoor, Professor of Medicine at University of Washington and Professor uh, uh, Riemann, um, from, um, uh, the, which is the first author of the European Guidelines for Diagnosis and Treatment of Insomnia. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Beth Freitz and Dr. Mihai Trofenschuk for their uh, support and presence. Thank you all for, uh, for being here and also thank you to all the participants and I hope to see you uh, very soon at our, our next webinar. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good